Marble. Marble is a town founded not on gold or silver mining, but you guessed it, marble quarrying. Back in 1873, high quality marble was discovered by geologist Sylvester Richardson during a scouting expedition in the area. It was only in the 1880s when marble grew as a town, both in supplying the nearby mining camp of Crystal and as a marble quarry. Though the marble was of very high quality, rivaling that of Italian marble, the remote location and freighting costs prevented serious quarrying until the railroad reached the town in 1906 and sparked a boom. Marble was a town of comical luxury, with marble being used to construct all the common things found in any American town of the day. Marble was used to construct people's houses, sidewalks, streets, the high school, and saloons. Marble quarried here went out to the grand homes and buildings across the United States. Marble from Marble was used to construct the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in 1930, as it was the only site that could provide the massive chunk of marble required, 124 tons right from the quarry and 56 tons after it was trimmed. It took 75 men over a year just to quarry the marble. Marble from Marble can also be found in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., along with buildings across the nation, including New York City, Denver, and San Francisco. Despite the demand for marble, the quarries closed in late 1941 after a massive mudslide swept away part of the town and years of bad financial management rendered the Yule Marble Company unable to recover. The U.S. Post Office closed only a year later in 1942. Quarrying operations, however, began in 2004, and marble once again has come to life. It is a popular destination for outdoor recreationists. Nevadaville Located just a mile up the mountain from Central City, in what was then Kansas Territory, Nevadaville was founded in 1860, when prospectors crawled over the hills looking for gold-bearing quartz. One woman who arrived in 1860 recalled that in those early days, men, women, and children would spend time looking for quartz, and were often disappointed at the end of each day, but would go out again the next morning with fresh hope that they would strike it rich. By 1861, life in Nevadaville had stabilized, and the town boasted 20 quartz mills, a number of stores, hotels, homes, and saloons. Mines named the Kansas, Ophir, and the Casey provided ample work for men looking to make a new start. The pay was good. A miner could earn between $3 and $4 a day. As the town grew, brick buildings replaced the wooden ones that originally fronted the main street. Many of the residents living in Nevadaville hailed from Ireland and Cornwall, and loved spending their money drinking in the saloons or gambling on whippet, dog races, and other sporting events. Nevadaville also boasted a first-rate cricket team and offered a silver pitcher to anyone who could beat them. By 1910, the town's population had declined a bit due to a lower gold output and all but died when labor prices and material costs forced the mines to close around World War I. By 1930, the U.S. census taker found only one man living alone in town. Leonard Nichols had called Nevadaville home for decades. In 1908, he was the master of the local Masonic Lodge and had run for city treasurer that same year. By 1930, Nichols was as much a hermit as a prospector. A reporter visited the town and found that much of it was left intact, with large furniture pieces still in homes, war bond posters in the old storefront windows, and an old copy of a 1916 newspaper celebrating a Babe Ruth performance in Fenway Park. After the entire town was purchased on a tax sale, Nichols hung on citing squatters' rights and firmly believed the town would come back to life once it became profitable to mine gold again. Nichols might have thought he was seeing his dream come true when families left destitute by the Great Depression moved into town and squatted in abandoned homes. The families did not stay long, however, and were driven away by the cold winter weather. It is not clear when Nichols died, but with him died the town. Today, Nevadaville is still privately owned, but you can drive down the main street and see the few remaining buildings like the Masonic Temple and the Old City Hall. Ore Ore is located in a high mountain valley sitting at 7,792 feet, 2,375 meters above sea level. Ore started as a mining community in the mid-1870s where gold and silver were extracted. Ore grew rapidly, but bad roads meant supplies were often in very short supply until the early 1880s when Otto Mears' crews of men carved toll roads out of Colorado mountainsides, paving the way for economic success in the town. It's said that before better roads were cut, diners eating at hotel restaurants brought their own butter and hungry miners would swarm freight wagons to buy food before it could be unloaded. Ore was named for the great Ute chief Ore, who lived for a while near the town. In 1884, the town was rocked by violence and scandal, 
when authorities were alerted to a case of child abuse and murder by a local ranching couple. The couple had agreed to foster an 11-year-old girl, Mary Rose Matthews, from Denver, but allegedly beat and killed her in January 1884. After neighbors recovered her body from the couple's ranch, the coroner publicly displayed her mangled and disheveled remains, the sight of which so enraged the locals that they masked and armed themselves and marched to the Delmonico Hotel where the suspects were kept in custody. Upon reaching the front door of the hotel, they met the hotel owner along with the sheriff, who told them to disperse. The mob responded by shouting for the sheriff to put his hands up. The sheriff replied, Go to hell! My name is Rawls and I throw my hands up for nobody, and began firing his pistol. After emptying his pistol, he retreated and was overpowered and disarmed by the mob. The mob convinced the three other guards to drop their weapons after a show of force and took the couple into their angry hands. The mob marched the couple down 3rd Street and threatened anyone who tried to intervene. The mob stopped at a cabin and placed a rope around the neck of Michael Cuttigan and tossed the other end up across the cabin ridgepole. There, they lynched him. The mob then used a tree across the street to lynch the heavily pregnant Mary Cuttigan. No cemetery wanted their bodies and so they were buried back on the ranch. Such could be vigilante justice in the American West. Silver continued to be the economic backbone of Ore until 1893, when the price of silver plummeted and Ore fell into a depression. It was gold, however, that saved the town when Thomas Walsh discovered nearby gold, which kept the town going well into the 20th century. Incidentally, it was the gold from Walsh's mines that helped enable his daughter to buy the infamous Hope Diamond in 1910. Today, the town is healthy and is a popular tourist destination, and still has many old buildings from its mining days. Pitkin In January 1879, around 30 prospectors picked their way up Quartz Creek and into a valley. They discovered enough mineral to conclude that they were onto something big, and decided to endure the winter of 1879-1880 in a tent camp. They called their tent camp Quartzville, or Quartz, but after a while, the name was changed to Pitkin, after the then Colorado governor, who was apparently a friend of one of the prospectors. By the summer of 1880, a formal town plot was surveyed, and up to 75 miners a day arrived in town looking to make it living or make it rich. Life in Pitkin in those early days was rowdy and lawless, as complained a reporter in the Rocky Mountain News. Pitkin was popular among the railroad workers, who labored to construct the Alpine Tunnel, which, at an elevation of over 11,500 feet, or 3,500 meters, was the highest railroad tunnel in the world. One evening, a railroad worker shot and killed a teamster over a card game. Justice was swift, and a newspaper colorfully reported that the killer was jerked to Jesus, meaning he was hung. The 1890s shook the silver market, and Pitkin had to rely on its growing logging and fishing industries after a state fish hatchery was constructed below the town in 1891. Thanks to these and other industries, and some nature tourism, Pitkin is still hanging on in the Colorado mountains, and is worth a visit. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share this video, and I will see you in the next video.